we will uh, wait a few seconds until everyone can go in. Again. Okay. Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. This is the fifth webinar in this area, uh, Polish Talk Mondays with Jewish Historical Institute, which is a cooperation between Moreshet, Mordechai Nilevich Memorial Education and Research Center, the Polish Institute in Tel Aviv, and the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. Today is International Women's Day, and our subject will be a very important and interesting figure, Rachel Oyerbach. We will hear about Oerbach from Dr. Karolina Shemaniak. We will have uh, 45 minutes of discussion and then approximately 15 minutes for questions from the audience. When we'll get to the questions session, please submit your questions via the Q&A button on your screen and not via the chat. If you would like to write your questions in uh, Hebrew uh, or in Polish, it's possible. Uh, we will do uh, our best to translate it into English. Dr. Keolina Shemaniak is a research fellow at the Jewish Historical Institute and assistant professor at the Department of Jewish Studies in Wrocław. Her research interests range across modern Yiddish literature, Polish Jewish cultural relations, translation studies, theories of modernism of the avant garde. In addition to having uh, taught uh, Yiddish language and culture uh, throughout Poland and Europe, she has also served as a consultant for the Museum of History uh, of Polish Jews and the Museum of Modern Art in Łódź. Her book uh, on the Polish Yiddish uh, modernist writer Deborah Fogel was published in 2006 in Poland. She co-edited Warszawska Avangarda Yiddish, Warsaw Yiddish Avangard, Dialogue Poetów, Dialogue Poets, Dialogue of Poets, uh, Montages, uh, Deborah Fogel, and the New Legend of the City, and Moya Jika uh, Koza, Anthologia Poetic Yiddish, uh, My Wild Goat, uh, Anthology of Women Yiddish Poets. She is the editor of Rachel Oerbach's Ghetto Writings, which received, in, um, which received the 2016 Politica History Award. So good evening, Carolina. Uh, you edited the, the book, which for now is available only in Polish, uh, Pismas Geta Warszawskiego, meaning writings from the Warsaw Ghetto. So to begin with, could you describe shortly the biography of uh, Rachel Oyerbach? Yeah, sh shortly, as we say in Yiddish, which is uh, uh, close to impossible because she is a very fascinating figure and she keeps fascinating me and she's been doing it for, for quite a while. So uh, she comes from a very small village, Lanovci uh, in Podolia, um, and she would uh, talk about her as a village girl. And it's important because later this village um, biography of hers helped her survive the Shoah. Um, she was, um, she was, she studied in L Lemberg in Lviv, Lvov at that time. Um, she studied psychology and history, which is also important because uh, somehow her historical training was uh, marginalized in the course of events and she was not treated as somebody who knew something uh, about the historical craft. So, but uh, first and foremost, she uh, considered herself herself a psychologist. She was pursuing a, mm, what we, I mean, we, it was PhD degree, but the system was slightly different, but simply a, a d diploma in psychology and psychognostics. She was very interested in the ex facial expressions of emotions, for example, and how the body reacts to emotions also very important later on because she was one of the people who very early understood that to give a testimony it mean, does not only mean to tell what happened it also means what happens with the with the witness and how the witness recounts this story and what uh, 
and what the body tells us so that we should not really marginalize also other uh, um, non-verbal reactions. Um, from what I'm telling you, you understand that she's a crucial person for the early Holocaust history. Why was that? Um, before the war, she was a writer, a journalist. She was very much involved in the women's questions. Hence, we're talking today about her and the International Women's Day. She was really, she, we could call her a some of her activities feminist, and maybe we'll have some time to talk about it later. She was a fervent Yiddishist while being also a Zionist. Um, although she was uh, somewhat uh, disappointed in the shape Zionist, Zionism took in, the Galish, in Galicia, where she was uh, active until 1930s, because she, she thought uh, Zionism was more involved with uh, Polish and Hebrew and was dismissing Yiddish. And uh, she, she believed that Yiddish is uh, crucial for modern Jewish identity. And she got very involved in the cause of Yiddish. She established a journal, helped establish an important modernist journal in Galicia. But soon she became disappointed. I mean, her life story is, story is a story of series of disappointments and a struggle of a very strong woman. And she moved to Warsaw, where she tried to finish her studies. She couldn't finish them in Warsaw. This is clear for her from her university records because she was, I mean, you had to pay at the, for the education. She did not have money, so she was resigning from this different co co courses, even though she got a scholarship from the uh, Jewish uh, journalist uh, syndicate and for a very curious topic, actually. For the the topic, her topic was the psychology of um, typos. Uh, I couldn't. I only found a, a folder with the name text in her archive. I wasn't able to locate the very text. Maybe she never wrote it. Maybe there, it was only a draft. But I would love to read actually as a queen of typos. I'm really a queen of typos when I'm writing my own text. Uh, a, psychology, a, a text uh, titled Psychology of Typos. Um, when the war broke out, she was in Poland. Uh, she was already quite well known as a writer and as a partner. And that's the problematic part of the story that we're describing a woman through her partner, but her partner was a Yiddish poet, Yitzhak Munger, and it was a very troubled relationship. Maybe we'll come back later to this. Um, and she, at that time, her partner was already not in, in uh, Poland. They broke uh, up. She was alone, and she decided to join her family in Lemberg, in Lviv. Lviv. Uh, her family, this means her, her brother's um, uh, her brother's wife, so her uh, sister-in-law and her children, her brother uh, died before the war. She had two children and uh, Auerbach treated those kids as her own kids. She never had a family of her own. Uh, but she was summoned by uh, none other than Emanuel Ringelblum, who told her that not everybody can allow themselves to leave and that she she has other responsibilities that her private life and private responsibilities. And he gave her task, a task to organize a soup kitchen. Um, that, and she started organizing it right away. Um, uh, and this kitchen was in Warsaw, of course, uh, at the Leshna Street. And this is something that, uh, that she started uh, doing. She was a very good organizer. She knew how to organize things. And this, th this is a thread in her life. She was organizing different in institutions, different, uh, uh, different uh, collectives. Uh, that's, and she, she's usually not very visible. She was doing it from the back. That's part of the, her story. So she only now be becomes very visible. She stays uh, in Warsaw. She becomes involved in the Alain Hill, so in the in the self help that is organized in the in the ghetto. She is the director the, uh, of the of the soup kitchen. And in the 1941, she is asked by Emanuel Ringelblum also to document her work. And she has a very peculiar position because she is really able 
I mean, as, a, as, 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 as the soup kitchen director, she's able to see what happens with different people very closely. And uh, in, in the documents we, we have uh, right now, she writes that this is a very peculiar observation point, the, the soup kitchen that gave her access uh, to, um, uh, to uh, really intimate access to the life of people that were starving to death. And um, so she, at first she can't really, please stop me if this is too detailed. Um, at first she's really, she can't start, I mean, she has troubles writing. She has a writer's block. She's very traumatized after 19, September, 1949 and the bombarding of Warsaw. She, 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 she was only able to write private documents but she cannot come back to writing. And Ringel Bloom sends to her one of the secretaries uh, of the um, um, underground um, Warsaw Ar um, ghetto archive, the so-called Oynek Shabes archive. Um, this is Eliohu Gutkowski um, and to encourage her. And finally, uh, in the late summer of 1941, she starts writing what we now know as her ghetto diary which is a very also an interesting, I mean, it's uh, the genre here, it's not very clear. When you think about diary, it's like taking notes about what happens in our life on the daily basis. These are more, and she calls them um, with this name, reportages, so reports, longer reports of what she uh, witnessed, what happened to people she worked with, but also she writes down um, um, different stories that are told by other people, most notably by her friend uh, who was a, in the Jewish police in the ghetto. And this is probably, and I'm really looking here at Noam, uh, Bervarm, with whom she lived in the same apartment in the ghetto. She was living with her cousin who was a Zionist. Uh, the family is uh, I mean, the, the, the Feldschuh family lives in Israel until today, and, and I was in touch with uh, the descendants of Ruven Feldschuh, uh, so Auerbach's cousin. So they live in this kind of ghetto um, um, apartment where a lot of more, more than one family lives. So she lives with her cousin, with uh, his wife and their prodigy daughter. Uh, Yosima Feldschuh, who was a very talented young pianist, uh, and uh, and with uh, Bervarm, uh, who really also gave her a lot of accounts, and she, she wrote down a lot of uh, what I mean, a lot of what she writes uh, comes from him, and not from what she actually witnessed. Um, this is and then and she writes in Polish this document we can come back to the question of languages but she also writes a, a monograph of the her work as a soup kitchen director um, in Yiddish and she starts this is an unfinished document and she starts rewriting it uh, we have a draft and then she starts writing a clear copy when the action so the uh, the the um, July action in the deportation action in the Warsaw Ghetto starts, and she stops to write to write her test. Uh, I mean, what we can call class will or testament, and she writes a very powerful document that is a an expression of her will willingness to take revenge. So she says in the document that she is able to kiss shoes of the worst scoundrel just to survive the war and to take revenge. And this motive of revenge is crucial also for many of her writings after 1942. She survives as, uh, as one of the few um, um, people who worked with the Oynek Shabbos archive. She survives the deportation action and then she becomes more crucial to the history of the archive as one of the few people who are still there. And she's given a very peculiar task. She's um, asked to take down the witness account of an SKP from the Treblinka camp. Uh, uh, this was Jakub Abram, as she calls him, uh, Kshepitsky. And she write, and this is one of the other documents that are there in the, in the, in the archive. And um, 
in March 1943, she is uh, uh, helped to escape to the so-called Aryan side. Uh, she doesn't have to hide at first, and because she has a so-called uh, um, good uh, look, so this is where she says that she looks like a Polish peasant girl, and this is crucial for her survival. But it's not only her looks, uh, it's also the story she's able to tell because she was very close to a Polish family that lived in her native uh, village of uh, Lanowitz, um, the family of Dobrutski. And she had, this family had a few, uh, few daughters. She was close to another uh, girl, but she choose, chose uh, the name of Aniela. Uh, Aniela Dobrutska, that's her, uh, that's her Polish name, that, uh, her, that's her occupation name. Be why does she choose this name? Did she choose this name? Because the vowels of the name Aniela, it's like ra e la a e a a e a um, that's one thing. So she's, she can identify with the name, but also she, she knows the family very well. So she has a story. She has a family story that she can tell, and it's not a fake story. And she explains that this was really, this helped her survive. She's working with a, a Jewish national committee and she's continuing her work of documenting uh, the destruction of uh, Warsaw Jewry. She writes two documents in Polish. These are meant to the, the, these are written for the Polish audience, for people to know what happened. And these are devoted to the, uh, to the deportation action, one document and the other to the uh, artists and intellectuals of the ghetto that is called Together with the Folk, Zludem Pospol, to Zamen mit in Folk in Yiddish, she writes it in Polish. So, and then about, about this engagement of intellectuals who share the fate of their people. Um, uh, so then she survives the war and she survives the, the so-called general uprising. So the Warsaw uprising of, of uh, 1944, and she leaves the city together with it. So a general population uh, after the uprising, when the war uh, ends, she starts to be very active in the Jewish uh, historical commission that starts operating in 1944 in the liberated part uh, of Poland. She's a journalist. She's active in the in the Association of Jewish uh, Writers and Journalists and writes for the the news, uh, the, the journal Dosna 11, The New Life. But she feels, on one hand, she feels that there is much to do with Yiddish and that Yiddish culture needs to be continued also in Poland and that she is, she says, we are heirs to a tradition but we are here to, to shape a new tradition. So to continue, not only to concentrate on the history, but on the other hand, she feels that there is not much to do in Poland anymore. Her friends leave, she feels more and more alone. And well, she's not sure where to go. She's trying America, she has cousins in America. She's thinking about Canada. She has friends there as well. Um, so thinking about friends, thinking about different possibilities, she chooses Israel. She was also sure, I mean, she's observing the post-war Polish anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish violence. She writes a very moving document about when the ghetto was burning Polish anti-Semites pro memoria. That's one thing. And then she's reacting to the Kielce pogrom in 1946. And she's writing also a memorandum um, that was never uh, uh, officially published. This was she wanted it to be a statement of the Association of Jewish Writers and Journalists, which never was actually issued. She's very disappointed in that. And very early, she writes to Batya uh, Temkin Berman, with whom she worked uh, on the so-called Aryan side, that there's nothing to do here for us, that we need to leave this place. So she's struggling between this um, uh, bond to the Polish Jewish tradition and the feeling that there's no place for uh, for her cause of also the cause and she decides to go to Israel to immigrate to Israel in, which she does in 1950 but before that she's crucial in uh, in the in the hmm. I stopped uh, my internet connection seems not to be working is it okay 
Yeah, and now it's yeah, okay. okay. Right. We, we so she's the, crucial uh, oh, in the endeavor. Okay. Okay. So she's crucial in the endeavor of uh, discovering the actual archive, the, what we know today as the Ringelbrum archive. After the war, it was not very clear to everybody that this is really a treasure. A lot of people thought, and this is described very well by uh, Professor Samuel Caso uh, Caso in his in his seminal uh, monograph of the of the of the archive, um, that many people believe that these are papers and there are people to be saved. So why would you spend money on looking? You know, Warsaw was a desert of rubbles, and to find a a cellar where the documents were. Uh, were uh, were hidden was close to impossible, and people thought. And this was a very very expensive endeavor as well. And uh, people, not many people believed it made sense. But Auerbach was one of the people who was really urging others to do it because she knew that this is this is an what she called a national treasure. This will be a foundation for the future uh, history. Of the Holocaust, and so the first part of the archive was discovered in September 1946 while she was still in Poland, and she tells this incredible story. She was in Łódź. She she lived in Łódź after the war, or Łódź, uh, and uh, she had this feeling that she has to go to Warsaw. She goes to Warsaw to the building of the commission, and there it is. The archive is there. The boxes. Uh, she 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 writes that one of the boxes was full with her her and uh, her partner's Itzik Munger papers. So, um, but when she leaves in 1950, it's before the second part uh, is discovered. So she only learns about it while in Israel. In Israel, she's trying to establish her her new life. She works for the radio. She works as a journalist. Um, but finally, uh, in April 1954, she gets a job at a newly uh, established Yad Vashem Institute, where she becomes the head of the department responsible for witness accounts um, collection. And she's really a person who is developing this, uh, this uh, department, not without problems, not without struggle from the Institute. At one point she loses her job and then she's uh, reinstated uh, and she has to also fight with the Institute for the money, for, for the method. Uh, that's something you probably know quite well, the struggle between German educated historians and uh, um, the um, the survival historians from Eastern Europe, and uh, this is some a story that I'm not going to tell right now, even on one uh, on one foot or on one leg, however you say it, uh, And um, but uh, but she really understands that you need not only to write down but to record that the visual is very important, that the voice is very important. Uh, still, she was not able to, to get enough money because it's also new technologies cost money. Um, she's also one people behind the Eichmann trial and she helps the per persecutor um, to list of witnesses. Her own witness account is really wretched. It's, uh, it was supposed to be longer, she's, uh, but she's speaking in the same session where Sylvia Lubetkin and uh, Antek Tukirman are speaking and really her, with, uh, her time is shortened. She's very, very uh, disappointed uh, and this was a traumatic event for her. Um, perhaps here I can, um, no, no quotes here. Um, maybe one, in the context of the trial, she wrote to her friend, as I have already explained to you, my work is not a gainful employment in the common sense of the word. word. It is a heavy vocation to use a sublime expression. And since not of, uh, all my collabor collaborators treat it this way, I have to make up for that alone, shoulder the lion's share of the effective work, which totally excludes any personal life. So she's here traumatized, but on the other hand, she thinks that this is a heavy duty, a duty that she has to carry on and that she has no right 
to private life. Uh, and she's presenting herself as this person who is carrying the past life that she says. She says, sometimes I feel like a woman pregnant, but not pregnant with the future life that is going to be born, a new kid, a new baby, but with a past life and that she's responsible for this past life. And she very, um, I mean, a lot of times she spoke of the documents as of her babies that she had to protect. And when uh, during different wars uh, in Israel, during different times, she wrote to her friends, I would send you my documents as one sends their children to be protected because this was the, as she presented it, uh, the goal of her life. And the, the life that she devoted to documentation of witness testimonies and the life that uh, gradually, I mean, that was left a little space for herself and for her other causes. She still pursued her Yiddish cause, this is very clear, but what is interesting, it left little space for her feminism, uh, which we might uh, um, come back later to. Well, but she finishes, I mean, she dies in um, 1976, uh, 30, 31st May of breast cancer very bad conditions, she was uh, impoverished, uh, uh, really a lonely, and, uh, and, uh, and this, to imagine this person uh, so lonely and dying in such bad condition is a very sad moment. Her um, lifelong uh, secretary told me also that while in her death bed, she was still dictating her a, a text. She was still working on her last book that was published posthumously, so she was, still devoted to, to, her, to her life goal. Um, and her last book was published 1977, so already posthumously. And we have few editions in Hebrew, Polish, and other languages of her different texts. So that's her biography, Afre Galaches. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, well, you're right, it's impossible to tell it shortly. Um, um, there were, as you said, she wrote a lot and there are uh, numerous editions of her work. Uh, one of them even published, uh, was published by Moreshet. So what uh, is important or uh, what was new in uh, this audition that you edited? Well, I mean, um, yeah, so uh, in Hebrew actually the situation was not so bad because already in the 1950s there was a Hebrew translation of her ghetto documents and other documents written uh, after she had uh, left the ghetto. This edition is the first full edition of what is there in the uh, uh, of her ghetto writings, uh, with one exception. So, with the uh, with the, there is the the Kshepitki testimony is not here. So, these are her own writings, so not uh, not the Kshepitki uh, Kshepitki's account. And what, what does it mean it, that this is full? To the fullest extent possible, I spent three years on this edition, and uh, this is this in, includes her ghetto diary that was written in Polish, um, her monograph. Um, this is a draft of the monograph of the soup kitchen, plus notes about the deportation action, and a letter to her uh, nephew uh, who was at that time in Lviv her nephew Mundek, um, who did not survive the war. She was really working hard to, to save him and she was not able to. Um, neither did her mm, sister-in-law and her uh, little niece. Uh, but when she already knew about it and she was trying to save Mundek and she was not able to. So these are the documents. They were uh, sometimes edited previously, but not to the full extent. So not all of what was possible to decipher. Um, and um, so uh, what I did, uh, I really uh, worked three years on these documents. They were uh, preserved in a different state. Some of them, maybe I will share the screen here. I had a nice picture, I forgot about it. So maybe we'll start with this nice picture. Okay, Weiss, that's Hoche Leuerbach here. I'm not sure if you can, what do you see? Uh, not sure what you can see here. Uh, 
Do you see Rachel Auerbach uh, talking to somebody? Um, yes, yes. That's a screenshot from a newsreel laying foundations for Yad Vashem. And you see here Auerbach, uh, and on the, her desk is the, uh, is the uh, photo of Emmanuel Ringelblum. Um, but that, what I would like to show you right now is this. So the materiality and destruction of the text from the, the ghetto. Um, so here you see the Polish text. It's not very badly written. Uh, it's, um, you see also that there is some kind of, she was trying to uh, cross out some parts. That's something she did after the war. You don't do it to archival documents normally. These are very private parts. Uh, so here very well uh, written, not very complicated uh, texts. Here you see they become more, uh, uh, less legible. And here totally very difficult to decipher anything here. So um, yeah, uh, close up perhaps. Um, yeah, so here, for example, is the last, uh, um, last part of the diary written on the 26th of July, 1942. Uh, this this really tiny text that was never edited before. Um, so what I did is I used what we call hyperspectral imagining. Uh, so if you have this very illegible illegible uh, page, you can work with uh, a, a special type of scanning. A human eye can only see three bonds, three spectral bonds. This is what we can see. And this machine can see a lot more and is very sensitive to different, to different things. For example, the kind of ink or the, the biological destruction, the biological agent that destroyed the text, et cetera, et cetera. So it helps us see a lot or little. Here you see little, this is the same page, but we see nothing here. But sometimes you see more. This is uh, still the same page. So sometimes I was able to decipher text thanks to this method. Uh, sometimes it was only one word that I saw uh, that helped me reconstruct the whole text. Um, um, this, this is, I mean, this is this text that you see here. So you see that thanks to hyperspectral scanning, I was able to see more in different uh, ways. Um, sometimes less, sometimes more. Uh, uh, this is an experimental method, so you have to see which spectral band gives you more and gives you less. This is a method used usually by peace or used by uh, art historians that uh, want to see what was um, uh, uh, what is here after uh, under a certain painting if there was another painting behind it. So uh, this is this kind of method, and. Um, here it gives you the best results with uh, with pencil. Here you see very clearly uh, that uh, this is the last part of first uh, uh, the last page of the first part of the diary. Here you see a list from 1924. So you see that she was using a a notebook from uh, before the war. Um, so this is one thing uh, I deciphered as much as was uh, possible. Um, in Polish and in Yiddish, some parts were really never edited. And why is it worth looking at this document? Because it's, it is a very powerful document of a person that very um, quickly understood that it's not only about documenting the uh, destruction, the Shoah. And, and she understood that what we need to do is not only write our own history, is also to show our own history, hence the title of this meeting today. She, uh, in this, this diary is a very visual text. What she does here with the language is to try to render the language visual because she, no, I mean, Jews were not able, I mean, it was forbidden to take photographs. Of course, there are some illegally taken photographs in the wars, in the archive uh, or to film uh, anything. Uh, Germans were, making their own propaganda movie in the ghetto, as you well known, as you well know. Um, and she's trying to do this, to write down this movie of, about the ghetto through her language. And right after the war, she was working with different, maybe I'll stop here my presentation. Um, she was working with different, um, um, different movie directors and she was rendering, I mean, she was translating her diary into the movies, uh, very early uh, Holocaust movies. Um, 
which includes Unzere Kinder and Ulita Graniczna, uh, one in Yiddish, one in Polish. She, she was uh, um, working also on these movies as, on, as consultant. And some of the scenes are simply taken from her own writings. And very early, she's making a plea for the Jewish movie industry. She says, well, there will be powerful, uh, which means like my, you know, the dominant cultures, they will be telling our story in their different languages. Of course, she was writing in Yiddish and she was very well aware that this is a minority language and nobody reads, I mean, nobody, not nobody, but uh, uh, mm, mm, very few people will read what is written in Yiddish. So how do you, uh, how do you, um, how to say it, how do you mainstream the story that is told by the survivors or told by the people who, who perished in the Shah and whose documents uh, were uncovered, for example, in the Ringelbrum archive? You need to, not only to edit them, of course you need to edit them, of course you need to make them available to the public, but you need to show them. You need, we need movies, that's what she's saying. And she writes uh, a few scenarios, which are not very successful, by the way. Um, and she writes this memorandum for movies uh, in the ghetto, uh, for, for the Holocaust movies, because she, in the early 1940s, late 1940s, I'm sorry, understands that the post-war public sphere won't be about the written word, will be about the visual, the image, which we, right now for, understand very well, but she does it very quickly. She understands it very quickly. And uh, so one thing she does, and this is what renders her writing very powerful, is to visual change the, the nature of the language, to, to represent this highly, what she calls like the spectacle, the spectacular uh, and very uncanny reality of the ghetto. And this is what is uh, very, what renders this text um, very strong. I call it a poetics of the cut. Cut because it's a film-like um, poetics. It's a film-like style. And she really writes in these tiny little uh, fragments that you could you know, see in a, movie, um, uh, in a movie shot. But on the other hand, it's cut because this, this language hurts. It hurts you and it's meant to hurt. It's a very precise language and uh, a language that through its own nature uh, tells you the story that she's trying to transmit. On the, on the other hand, this, so this is, this is the, 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 the importance of these documents. Uh, of course, I mean, it's very hard to say that they're more or less important documents. No, all of them are uh, important, but why was it worth to spend three years to decipher, you know, like 70, 80 or uh, 150 pages? Uh, well, because of that, because uh, uh, we, uh, we, we, I mean, I think each text of that kind is worth this kind of work. Uh, but she, Auerbach brings a very powerful message with this text. And also because of what who, who she became after the war, because she was one of the three surviving members of the um, uh, Warsaw Ghetto Archive. And she was the person who was uh, writing also, I mean, like uh, commem um, me memori I mean, commemorating the, the, the activity of the Oinek Shabbos group and writing their story among others, of course, not the only person who had did that. Um, but also this person who really was able to see what the future of the public sphere is and who will decide, I mean, what decides that one, uh, I mean, a story of one person is heard and the story of another person remains uh, unseen and unheard. Okay, so uh, if you talked about the language of the image, I would like to take you back to the, let's say, written language. So you talked about it a bit before, and also uh, Jacek Leotjak uh, wrote in a short review that uh, Orbach lived in uh, two languages, Polish and Yiddish. So can you explain what was the meaning of these two languages for her, and what can we learn about her through each language? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was fully bilingual. So she was Yiddish, uh, uh, a native Yiddish speaker, and uh, she spoke uh, 
Polish perfectly from her childhood on, so she was fully bilingual. She switched, she switched through between the languages. Before the war, uh, she was using both. Um, uh, she, her education uh, was in Polish, of course. She also knew and understood uh, some Ukrainian, and she knew German that she refused to use after the war very firmly. And um, mm, so these are Polish and Yiddish are her two own languages, as we can uh, say. But for different reasons, I mean, but she was, uh, when it comes to her language politics, she was involved in the cause of Yiddishes. So she was convinced that Yiddish should be the foundation, <laughs> Yiddish and Yiddish culture of the modern Jewish identity. And this did not exclude her Zionism. By the way, that's a more complex. I mean, the simplified vision that you are a Zionist and you simply um, disregard Yiddish. Uh, I mean, this was perhaps the mainstream, but uh, I mean, a lot of Galician uh, Zionists, left Zionist, uh, leftist Zionist as Emma Angela Ringelblum, were also involved in the cause of Yiddish. Um, she already before the war she would write to her friends that she only writes in Polish because she earns more money. She, you know, you earn as a, you're, when you're a journalist, you earn simply because you write an article. So we can write an article in Yiddish and publish in, it in Polish, it helps you. But uh, that she is not willingly writing in Polish. Um, and this is part of her language politics. And she also writes it in the 1930s. And we're in Poland in the situation of rising anti-Semitism and uh, the wave of pogroms uh, in, the late, uh, in the mid 1930s that goes uh, through Poland. So that's her answer also, not only her answer, many people also uh, at that time, mm, uh, first after the first wave of pogroms in the 1918, uh, 1919, refused to write in Polish and then later in the 1930s. Uh, on the other hand, um, and, and, and she remained um, faithful to this, uh, to this uh, uh, explanation. And while, when she was writing her, uh, her lifetime book, which is called Warszawertsawoles, the Warsaw Testament, uh, she explains that I mean, she asked herself, why did I write in Polish in the ghetto? Why was this text written in Polish? And she says, well, I was writing in a notebook. Uh, that is my that was my notebook uh, from uh, girlhood time when I was a girl and I was writing it in Polish. So I just continued. This does not uh, sound like a plausible explanation. Why did you continue? You, no, no, no reason to continue. And then why did you write it as a girl in Polish as well? So here she's trying to diminish the importance of Polish for understandable reasons. Uh, but I think there are other possibilities. Uh, as we know, and this has been uh, analyzed by uh, other uh, scholars such as uh, David Roskies, so language politics in the ghetto uh, was very much connected to what was happening in the ghetto. So uh, people were changing, switching languages from Yiddish to Hebrew, from Polish to Yiddish and in different directions, depending on the, on the moment uh, in the history. I think for, we can think about it uh, for example, in, in about Polish as her own language, but also language that is uh, not fully her. So she, it's hers and not hers, as, as if. And in the 1940, she writes that she needs connection to the Polish culture because it's a connection to a normal word, a word that is not crazy, the word that has a, some sense of freedom, even in the occupation, uh, uh, in the in the situation of occupation, and that she needs this connection to the Polish, great Polish um, freedom and liberation tradition, and to the romantic Polish tradition. That's what she writes. So one of the reasons for writing is this, perhaps. Another reason is that the reality she is describing is an uncanny reality. What we call in German, I'm sorry, she wouldn't be happy about me using German, unheimlich. What Freud calls unheimlich. So something that is home, uh, uncanny is or unhomey. So it's home and not home as Polish for her, home and not home. So this, this uh, paradoxical situation of a language that is yours and, and, and not yours at the same time helps her perhaps describe the uncanny reality. She's using this term to say, to describe uh, 
the ghetto reality, uncanny reality. She, she was a psychologist and she was interested in psychoanalysis. So that's why I think this line of explanation is also justified. By the way, a very interesting part of her writing is also the way when she has a writer's block and she has a struggling with a traumatic experience, she starts writing through, through, through describing um, a whole, um, dreams. Uh, she's describing dreams and analyzing her own dreams. So this is a, a point of entry for her to start writing. So, th so that's why Polish um, and why Yiddish, I mean, um, Yiddish, the monograph of the soup kitchen was written as for a contest in the ghetto. So perhaps she thought it would be more appropriate to write it in Yiddish. On the other hand, uh, this was a, this, so this was a form, more formal text. But she also writes her testament, last will, uh, uh, in Yiddish. So in the moment of really the greatest uh, distress during the, the deportation action, she chooses to write in Yiddish as well. And she repeats these words, nekome, 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 uh, in Yiddish. Um, so this, this, is, this is her uh, ideological choice. This is her identity choice. And this is the language that is the language of the people that are perishing. So that's why Yiddish. But there is a tension between Yiddish and Polish, constant tension um, between Yiddish and Polish throughout her writing. She writes after the war, uh, to her friend uh, in Switzerland that it's sometimes easier for her when she's using, because in her text she was rewriting classical, uh, let's say, um, religious genres. She was using genres as Yiskar or Kaddish um, to write, uh, to, 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 she was transforming these genres to write uh, the story of the destruction. And sometimes she says, it's easier for me to use biblical allusions in Polish or in Hebrew than in Yiddish, uh, because uh, I mean that's how she learned these, uh, le learned the text. So sometimes, as in case of a multilingual individual, simply it's functional. Sometimes it's easier to say something in one language, and sometimes it's easier to say something in another language. So uh, that's uh, yet another explanation, perhaps. Okay, let's. Uh... Uh, and also questions from the audience. Um, has she, as Rachel Orbach, uh, uh, wrote about Immanuel Ringelblum, a biography or a, a analysis of his character, etc.? cetera? Uh, where can one find such material? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there is uh, some material, I mean, in her press articles, her bibliography has, I mean, I'm working on a full bibliography of her, of her articles, which is, I think a lifetime work, I, I don't know, I have hundreds of entries right now. But uh, if you go to our website, it is um, Central Judaica Library, it's cbg.jhi.pl, uh, uh, um, and you type Orbach and Ringelblum, for example, there's a full article she wrote and it's available digitized online on our website. I think we can simply, I don't know if I write it here, Will everybody see it on the chat, the, the web address? Okay, yeah. so that's it. Uh, Central Judaica Library, this is a digitized, the, the, col the, the collection of digitized documents from the Jewish Historical Institute. This is a collection that is expanding and the whole edition of the Ringelblum archive in Polish and now it's gradually in English also, also available there and the originals of the documents too. So you can search it yourself, see the documents yourself. Um, part, I mean, um, so this articles and, uh, and also part of her book, uh, uh, has also, and parts of it, of it are devoted, uh, to Ringelblum, but formally as a book, for example, she never wrote a biography of, uh, of Ringelblum as such. And plus, for example, these articles she wrote about Ringelblum and the Ringelblum archive are sometimes also available in multiple language versions. So if you would write me, I can refer you to specific articles. Sometimes they have also Hebrew versions, for example. Okay. Uh, you mentioned a uh, feminist attitude in some ways. So can you tell us uh, about this aspect in uh, writing? Yeah, I was waiting for this. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's an International Women's Day. Yeah, this is a very interesting story because, I, as I told you, uh, when after the war, there's less and less feminism in her own uh, writings. But she very early um, understands in, in the 1920s, in the late 1920s, um, the position of women in the public sphere uh, is uh, very peculiar and that women are marginalized and that, um, that for example, they're paid less or, for example, they need to be beautiful or otherwise they will not be, uh, they have no entry point to, uh, to the to the, for example, literary um, in uh, Mulier. Uh, she wrote a very funny thing in the 1930s. I need to open my quotes here uh, to tell you. Um, sorry, oh, where is it here? Um, yep, here. Um, oh, perhaps not. Mm, okay, it doesn't want to uh, open, so um, I'll try without my quotes. Uh, oh yeah, that's my, Okay, that's the first thing, the, her first letter I found um, in, in 1928. And she's writing um, and she has a hangover. I never thought I would be curing, uh, curing hangover by writing and maybe sending, I haven't decided yet, clumsy letters at the dawn. I thought I grew out of it, but however strange it may, it may sound to myself, here I am, writing a letter to you, an apology of female, female uncommonliness and beauty. I have a friend, both of us are not beautiful. People notice it right away when they see us together. We've been discussing the problems of uh, non-beauty, uh, cleverness and love. For women, it's better not to be beautiful because uh, if they're beautiful, they're automatically treated other, as beautiful women and not intelligent women. So she thought perhaps it's a chance for her. And um, she also understood that she's being marginalized and she writes about it very clearly and uh, also criticized because she is a woman. She says they criticize it because a Yidana, a Jewish woman, uh, deals with it. It's her, it's her thing. Um, so what she, how she responds to this? She responds by writing a series of feminine or proto-feminist articles about different uh, topics. For example, she writes a very funny series about the role of ma men and women in the human history. And this is a very popular series. It's not very scientific. It's not academic. It's published in a daily. And uh, uh, it's obviously not uh, also grounded in, in uh, not only grounded in scientific research, but she's trying to rewrite the history of humankind from the perspective of women and showing how women were more important to the human history and how they got marginalized. And she's um, she's writing this history up to the uh, uh, present time, I mean, her present time, so up to the modern age, up to the war uh, and uh, showing the importance of women uh, and also um, discussing the, the so-called female nature. So she's thinking that these are constructed more and uh, um, constructed uh, um, stereotypes or uh, some features or characteristics that are actually an effect of socialization and not something that is natural for women. So she has this constructivist also outlook on the uh, question of gender. Um, that's one of her responses. Another response is to rewrite the history of women of, uh, of uh, women writers. So she writes a lot about women writers in Polish and in Yiddish. And she's also uh, trying something that we could call gene genealogy. So the female gene genealogy of uh, women, uh, of writing women. And she, what she does, she's writing this series of articles about different uh, uh, women writers. And she does a very interesting thing because she's not only writing about Jewish writers or Polish writers, she has this, this series about different writers writing in English, in Polish, in Yiddish, and showing that the female, strong female tradition tradition, long female tradition, that there is a story to this writing and uh, that uh, has not been, uh, has been overlooked, uh, had been overlooked actually, if we're thinking about the past time. 
so this is uh, this is another thing. A lot of articles about different discoveries of, uh, for example, um, women writers in old Yiddish literature. So she's uh, she's very sensitive to these topics. Yet another threat in her writing in the pre-war time would be how to help women be active today because they have to, for example, so how to, for example, organize kindergartens, how to help women uh, be, um, uh, be uh, professionally active. This is also something that I think is very interesting and very modern about her writing. She's also, she understands very quickly as well that it's not only about gender, and this is something feminism uh, understood later on, feminism as a movement, uh, not particular people perhaps, but she understands it that it's not only about gender, it's also about um, uh, ethnicity and, and class. So that feminism has to be more sensitive to these differences. And at that time, feminists, feminists were not. So she's uh, and she's sensitive to these topics because she's also writing about the uh, the situation of uh, uh, Jewish girls and women who are who experience uh, double exclusion as women and as Jewish women, as Jews. So so this is another fascinating thing about her. So this sensitivity to to different uh, uh, different differences. Um, and uh, this topic was so important to her that she's uh, in the ghetto um, when she was preparing one of her public lectures, she chose to write about uh, women in Yiddish, to speak about women in Yiddish literature. That's the topic she chose. And uh, in, in, in the final words uh, of this, uh, of this uh, article, I have a draft, of, I mean, a lecture, not article, I have a draft of it. So she's hoping that after the war, the, 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 the women writers will be able Able to fully express themselves and find uh, the right place uh, in the post-war public uh, um, sphere. Um, and right after the war, she's also continuing this kind of writing. For example, when she's writing about the diary of Batya Temkin, she's uh, placing her in, in the feminist uh, in the tradition of feminist uh, writing, of feminist prose, feminist Polish prose. So she's still um, interested in this, uh, in this uh, kind of um, networking or placing women in this uh, broader feminist, uh, women writers in broader feminist tradition. But with time, and she writes a very interesting, very um, literally very weak uh, thing, um, have, um, a short novel about the ghetto. And there is one scene where she's, uh, when there is a psychologist and there is this uh, discussion between different people in this uh, novel. And one woman says, men are afraid of strong women. And then there is the, the whole discussion why it happens and why women also, um, mm, why women also decide to be with men who marginalize them. And it seems to be our back's own story because she, as a very strong woman, as a very self-conscious woman, she was involved in very troubled uh, relationships with different men. And the most important one is Itzik Manger, who was abusing her uh, verbally and physically um, to the point that when they met uh, after the war in London, he would uh, um, publicly insult her. And she, this person who survived the ghetto survived the Holocaust and was the person who was so strong, she publicly started crying because she was not able to, to, to uh, grab, uh, to, to cope with the, with the abuse from her once closed, uh, part, close partner. So that's, that's something that probably something to be, to be written. I'm, I'm trying to write about it more, um, but to wrap it up, the, this um, top, this thread of her writing and her activism becomes less and less important with time after the war. We see it less and less. In the 1940s, still very prominent, late 1940s, later 1950s, maybe beginning 1950s, less and less in the coming years. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question, maybe it will be the last one since it's already eight. Um, what was her attitude toward the job, Jewish fighting organization? Okay, that's uh, that's not something she was, I mean, she was interested in the, of course, in the 
and uh, she wrote also the whole book about the Warsaw um, uprising. Um, um, this was a book that was actually um, 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 uh, she, she did not want to write it herself. So uh, this was a, um, a request. So she wrote it on request. So she did not like the book very much, but it's, and it's not her strongest book, I think, but there was a lot of interest in the book lately. Everybody was translating it. Um, so she was interested uh, in, the, in the armed resistance, that's for sure. But on the other hand, her thing was, uh, and she devoted simply much more uh, space to the unarmed resistance, to the civil resistance. And she uh, understood it as her own task to write the other story. So, so she was, uh, uh, she, but she did, I mean, of course for her, the uprising was very important and the armed resistance was very important. It simply was not something she focused on. So Jacques was not something she would focus on. We, we could find uh, here and there are different, uh, and, and in the book about the uprising, of course. Uh, and uh, this is something she thought is very important, but she thought also that this is something that cannot be talked about without the other side. So if we think about the monument to the, to the, uh, to the uh, ghetto fighters, so, the other side of the monument is equally important. And that's that was her thing. So she focused more on that. Maybe a small, one more question. I'm, I'm willing to answer more questions. Uh, but you'll have to answer it shortly. Uh, are, well, there no. <laughs> are there things that you can assume or know that she chose not to write about? Uh, you have to say uh, say it again because there was a thing uh, in the connection. Are they were they any themas or things that she you can assume or you know that she chose not to write about, not to deal with? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, I think yes there were, and probably many and. Um, mm, First of all, very consciously, she uh, decided not to write about her private life. And this is what we, uh, so about private things. And I think this is the, I know that the question is probably about other things, so other problems and topics, but this is something that she consciously tried to erase from her own writings. So something that I think is mo most important. And when I told you that she said that I have no right to private life. I have no, because, so this is something she she chose to be, to be this public body that transmits the story and not to have a private life and, or pretend not to have a private life. So uh, all, all these things concerning intimate life in the ghetto of different people, for example, this is something she, she did not uh, want to uh, write about. Um, um, so I, I would stop here because otherwise we would uh, go into very difficult topics about Jewish police and you had a whole whole uh, also a webinar about it. So maybe I'll stop here with this point. Because you were, uh, uh, you, you answered very shortly. So we have time for more one short. Uh... Oh, no, you told me to, to answer shortly. So I was trying to just don't go to other. No, I think okay. I would like to give as much as possible yeah. from, uh, questions from the audience. What was uh, her relationship with uh, Raphael Mahler? Um, uh, not, not, uh, not something that I know much about. So uh, not something that I would uh, intensely. So she had a very uh, close uh, relationship, for example, with uh, Philip Friedman and his wife Ada, uh, but not with Mahler. Uh, not something that I am able to talk about more. Okay. Yeah. I, I get now quick questions, which doesn't mean that there, it's nothing to talk about. It uh, only means that I uh, cannot say anything interesting about it. So there is uh, an, another in the same um, spirit question about Itzik Mandel, Mangel, if you can say anything, uh, something more about the relationship with him. Ooh, 
here now we are opening a whole uh, hell of uh, of things that I would be able to say. I will uh, so because I need to be sure. Um, yeah, they were uh, they met in the 19th century. She was married to another poet, and uh, the divorce was nasty. And uh, uh, and uh, she was with Munger. Munger was uh, this kind of bohemian poet who drank a lot of alcohol. Was kind of disorganized, and she was organizing this his whole life, uh, rewriting his texts, uh, taking care of the fees, uh, working with him. We know that on that she we see her handwriting, so we know that she did this or that. And he was really physically and um, verbally. And um, and when he was and one really important moment was in the 19, 1931 eight I'm sorry um, when she had a um, a surgery and he was so I don't know psychotic about her having a surgery leaving him that uh, he really abused her she was so uh, traumatized that she did not want to come back home after the surgery so this tells you a lot about it and um, then that was the moment when the relationship ended. But Munger believed, well, she, he, she will come back to him after the war. He was writing for her during the war. And there are some poems that are for, for Rochelle. And, um, but she did not want to. She believed that she cannot you know, take this kind of burden on her shoulders because she has another burden. This is the documentation of the of the uh, destruction. But she was still taking care of Munger, writing to different friends and trying to help him. After this London situation, they never met personally. Uh, but uh, what I can refer you to is this wonderful book in German, unfortunately, uh, which is called uh, Niemandes Sprache, uh, written by a, a Israeli-German uh, scholar, Efrat Galet which discusses the relation in details. So if you're interested, that's quite a thick book. Uh, it's about Munger, but uh, Rochleurbach makes an important part of the book and of the whole story. I hope I was quick enough. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Carolina. Um, I hope uh, we will be able to see a Pisma de Geta Varshevskiego also in English and in Hebrew. Uh, as soon as possible and uh, thank you all for taking part uh, well it comes to Hebrew I'm counting on Moresha <laughs> <laughs> well, um, also. Um, uh, thank you too for being here I'm sorry I can't see you uh, but it was a pleasure to speak to you sorry I wasn't I'm lazy enough to not to speak in Hebrew um, and I'm sorry, I couldn't speak in Yiddish. You won't give all to Takia. Shane and Dankai. Thank you all. And I would like to thank also, uh, and again, first of all, to you, Karolina Shemaniak, to Moreshet, Mordechai Nilevich Memorial Education and the Research Center, to Magdalena Shishkovska from the Immanuel Ringenbloom Jewish Historical Institute, and to Yulia Matskevich Saban from the Polish Institute in Tel Aviv. Thank you all. Keep safe. Have a good night.